Last talk of this session is by Alexander A. Fraser from ETH Zurich. The title of the talk is Cosmology with Dark Energy Survey. So first, I'd like to thank the our organizer, uh, Rishi, Shuba, and Azim for inviting me here and organizing this great workshop and also give me the opportunity to visit this uh, center here, which I've heard a lot about and it's really uh, very nice. Um, thanks a lot for, for that. So what the organizer asked me to do is to give a, a review of the status uh, of the Dark Energy Survey, which is a, an experiment uh, which is uh, currently ongoing uh, and which has a purpose to uh, measure dark energy, but also to uh, measure other aspects and other sectors of the cosmological model. So what is the Dark Energy Survey in one slide? So the Dark Energy Survey is an imaging uh, survey, imaging uh, experiment, uh, which is a, um, uh, made possible by the installation of a very large CCD camera shown here called DECAM uh, on the uh, CTIO 4 meter telescope in Chile. This camera has uh, 74 uh, chips, each of them 2K by 4K, with a resolution of 0.27 arc second pen pixel and a, field, a large field of view of 2.2 square degrees. And uh, the idea is to have as large as possible, a large camera as possible on this telescope in order to cover as large a region of the sky. And eventually the, exper the survey will cover 5,000 square degrees uh, for a wide survey in the southern sky, of course. Uh, and uh, also there will be some, there are also some deep field um, which are driven by uh, supernovae uh, survey, uh, experiments. The survey will be, is done in five bands to a magnitude of about 24, and eventually it will have 300 million galaxies. And the uh, scientific drivers, so the survey, a survey like this can do, uh, can have a lot of application, including a lot of astrophysics. Some of what was discussed before uh, today, I'm sure yesterday as well, uh, can be studied with the survey, but the survey was driven by these four cosmological probes and optimized to optimize to uh, minimize the error on the dark energy parameters. So one is weak lensing, the other one is galaxy clustering, the other one is clusters of galaxies, and the other one is supernovae. So I'll describe some of the latest results um, in these different probes. I will focus mainly on, mainly on weak lensing and galaxy clustering. I will say a little bit on supernovae. I apologize to Joe that I won't say anything on clusters because I, one, don't have time, second, I haven't followed much, and third, the results are ongoing and about to come out, I think. For the, for the first year results. Doesn't mean it's not important. So in order to make this experiment uh, possible, of course, we need a large number of collaborators and institutions. So there are uh, 350 scientists in 28 institutions. You see them in red in the US, UK, Brazil, Switzerland, Germany, Spain, and Australia. And of course, the telescope here is in uh, Chile. So what will the survey uh, eventually cover? Well, as I said, it will cover um, these uh, 5,000 square degrees in the south. So this is the region. So this outside black line corresponds to the limit um, of the footprint of the survey. This sometimes is referred to as the tank uh, with the cannon being here. And uh, for the moment, uh, we have results and analyzed results from the first, well, from the science verification data, which is in green. You might have seen papers on science verification data, but more recently, on the year one um, re data release, which is a red region here and here, uh, as well as some of the deep field supernova field, which are shown here in this lighter green color. And as I said, eventually it'll, it'll, the survey will cover all this region. And in fact, uh, the observations now have been fully completed for the full survey. And uh, we are currently well, finishing the analysis for, for Y1 for some of the probes. And also we, are, um, we have an ongoing analysis for the third year release uh, and the data processing uh, has started for the full uh, survey, the, the fifth year data. So what do we find? Well, let me first focus on weak gravitational lensing, which was uh, already described uh, several times uh, here. So it's a technique in which we can measure the shape of galaxies and from which infer the uh, projected mass distribution in the universe. So this was one of the drivers for the image quality and the size and some of the uh, requirements of the survey. 
And uh, this is the uh, latest mass map that we derive um, for the first year uh, data set, uh, data release with the Dark Energy Survey. So this covers 1,500 square degrees. It corresponds to here, let me show you this region here on the map. And again, here, uh, excluding this uh, Canon uh, region. And you see, this is the largest contiguous weak lensing uh, map that has, been, that has been done. It's very impressive. Uh, what is shown here is um, a, a density plot. So in red, you have the over densities, the places where the density field is highest, and in blue is the under densities. And you see these various structures. So we can use these maps for various purposes, including comparing this with luminous matter and measure bias and so on. Uh, but one can also look at the statistical properties of this um, projected mass distribution and infer cosmology. So this is, for example, um, in the, this, um, this first, um, this weak lensing analysis with this uh, first year data. Uh, this is the correlation function of the weak lensing, weak lensing signals as a function of angular scale. This is in, uh, so this will be uh, small scale, large scale. This is the amplitude of the, of the uh, lensing signal, weak lensing signal coming from the clustering of matter. Uh, it turns out that there are two such correlation functions and can take various combinations of them. There's a very clear signal, as you can see uh, in, this, uh, in these uh, correlations. And one can do even further to extract more cosmological information is what we can do is we can um, separate the galaxies into different redshift bins using the photometric redshift afforded by the five bands of the survey. So, for example, one can <coughs> separate the... Um, the galaxies in these four different bins, and then we can make effectively four maps, and we can cross-correlate these four maps with, them, with four maps with themselves, or we can also cross-correlate uh, the different maps together. So that gives a, a combination of correlation function, which looks like this, a kind of a complicated plot. So uh, you see this correlation function corresponding to the same uh, redshift bin. So this would be along this uh, line here. And also all the cross correlations between different, the different bins. And as I said, there are two correlation functions. So this gives a kind of a matrix of correlation function. And then one can predict um, the, um, the expected signal for um, the uh, given cosmological model and fit and get constraints on the model. So this is what was done here. So this is the constraint using uh, the year one data using weak lensing information only. And uh, we can constrain various parameters, but the parameters we're the most sensitive to is this combination of sigma-8 and omega matter. So omega matter is a matter density in use of a critical density, and sigma-8 is the amplitude of the matter of the density fluctuations on 8 megaparsec scale. So this gives us a measure of the uh, amplitude of the mass fluctuation, which is what lensing is measuring, so that's why we're most sensitive to it. So what you see here in uh, the, the, the gray area is the results from, for the dark energy survey. Uh, it's compared to the green region here, uh, which are the constraints coming from the Planck uh, experiment when we project the amplitude of the Planck uh, temperature fluctuations to um, the local universe. And you see that there's overall uh, a, a quite good agreement, but there's a little bit what is something referred to as a tension between the two. It's not very significant, but that's something that we can uh, keep an eye on. And what I'll show a bit later is a, a, another representation of the same plot. So what we can do, you see there's a, de, there's a characteristic degeneracy between omega matter and sigma 8 for this kind of measurement. So it's convenient sometimes to plot, instead of plotting sigma 8, is to plot sigma 8 times omega to some power, which kind of flattens this, these contours. Uh, this is called this parameter S8. Um, and this is plotted here. So it's the same information, just a, just if a trans, uh, change of coordinates, if you want change of parameters. So again, this would be the gray one, and um, blank uh, will be the green one. Uh, by the way, the blue contours come from another experiment called KIDS. I'll come back to the comparison between the two a little bit later. Now we can expand also the lambda C to, from lambda CDM to, a, um, to a, a, a model which has more parameters in the dark energy sector. So this is the so-called WCDM model, where we also now vary uh, the equation of state parameter W of dark energy, assuming that it's a uh, constant. And then we get these kind of rather broad uh, uh, contours. So again, there's in gray and Planck in green, all consistent with W equal minus one. I'll come back to that also in a minute.
Okay, so this is using weak lensing only. So then one can start using more and more information. So for example, well not for example, an important one is to use weak lensing and clustering. All right, so we use not only the weak lensing map, but we can also look at the density fluctuations of the number of galaxies as a tracer of visible matter. And then we can combine this information together. So what is shown here, for example, is again sigma 8 or omega m. Let's look, for example, at, for example, at the sigma 8 plot, at the SA plot, um, where you see um, the contours that we get for weak lensing only. So these are the green contours. And then in red is the contours that we get when we uh, use clustering and the cross correlation between cluster, uh, galaxy clustering and weak lensing. So we get the red contours. And then if they're combined together, then we get the blue contours, which are, of course, smaller. Now, you notice that the gain is quite large, uh, maybe a factor of two in, in this area. Uh, but you also notice that the blue contours are a little bit to the left of the green contours. Again, all consistent and not significant. But it means that if we compare to Planck, which is shown here, when we add the clustering, it tends to pull the contours a little bit away from Planck. So it makes the tension a little bit worse. Again, uh, it's not very significant, uh, not something to lose sleep over, but it's certainly something to keep an eye on in the future. So in this plane, this would be the um, Planck constraints. Here is the DES, your one constraint using wing lensing and clustering and the cross correlation here. Uh, what you notice also is that the size of the Planck contour compared to the DES contours are comparable. Uh, which means, which is very interesting, because it means we're entering the era where the galaxy surveys are starting to give comparable information to the CMB. Um, this is known to be the case uh, in the absence of systematics when these surveys, these galaxy surveys, will cover most of the sky. We're slowly entering it. Now, to be fair, uh, actually, the, the CMB for the moment can constrain a lot more parameters than uh, these galaxy surveys, but nevertheless, we're starting to be in this, in this, in this. Um, uh, uh, era, which means that we can compare the two and um, get stronger tests of our models. That's very interesting. Now, as we've done before, we can expand now to a WCDM model. So now we can vary W. Sorry, it's kind of a busy plot, but the one to focus on is this one. This is omega matter versus W. This time now including not only weak lensing, but also uh, clustering. And again, um, DES is in blue, Planck. Uh, in green, and then combined together is red, which is again consistent with W equal minus one, but now with a higher precision. Okay, so how does now this uh, DES Y1 result compare to other surveys? So there are two uh, very good surveys which are also ongoing and to which we can compare to. One is the kids survey, which for the moment covers 450 square degrees, also in, in a telescope in Chile. And then there's the Subaru Hyper Supreme Cam Survey, which I think was described by Surud uh, maybe yesterday, I think, uh, which covers now, I think, 130 square degrees so far. Also, both of them are still ongoing and they're analyzing more and more uh, data. And basically, the results are, are, quite, are quite consistent. There's little differences. Uh, there was originally a, so again, this is omega m versus sigma 8. So originally, uh, there was a little bit of an offset between the DES contours, which are blue, and the KIDS contours, which are here. Uh, there's been since then a reanalysis by um, Troxel et al., which have shown that um, um, a new version of the covariance matrix needs to be taken into account by taking into account uh, some subtle effect having to do with the, um, the shape noise in these weak lensing measurements. And when you do this, uh, the, weak, the, the DES results don't change very much, but the KIDS results move a little bit upwards which means that the, uh, both the difference between kids and DES uh, is smaller, and also the, uh, different, the tension between kids and Planck is also reduced. Uh, so this is the updated result. Not done by the kids, by others, but I think uh, the kids seem probably uh, agree with this, I would assume. And then um, this is a comparison. This is a recent paper by the Subaru team. Uh, what you see here again on the sigma 8 omega m plane, uh, this is DES in blue, Subaru in red, and Planck in purple, and also some versions of kids here 
and you see that Subaru is also mostly in agreement, slightly shifted to the left, uh, but uh, certainly consistent with the dark energy survey uh, constraints. So what we get out of this is that now the measurements of this amplitude are getting more and more precise. Some of these tensions are being, um, are being reduced. Again, good to keep an eye on them, uh, but they tend to be, uh, they tend to, to go uh, more on the way down, I would say. Okay, now another kind of analysis one can do with clustering is to look at baryon acoustic oscillation. So we can look at the correlation function of galaxies and try to uh, study the wiggles which are produced by uh, acoustic oscillation uh, in the early universe, which are the same sort of physics that generates the peaks in the CMB power spectrum. Uh, with DS, one can do it. Uh, it's more difficult because we don't have spectroscopic redshift, but only photometric redshift. So we have quite, we're washing out the information in the redshift direction. But on the other hand, we have a lot of galaxies, so we can to some degree compensate. So this is a measurement of this uh, first uh, BO peak. Uh, this is a measurement of the correlation function of, um, of the projected galaxy uh, correlation function uh, to which was the, the smooth part without the BO was subtracted. And we see this peak here. We can measure the position of the peak and then plot it on this uh, BO diagram, which shows the redshift and the, um, uh, the angular diameter distance uh, of the uh, BO. Uh, here, this is the other measurements by various other surveys, most of them spectroscopic. And this is the uh, current um, measurement from DS. Uh, it's the, I think, the, the highest redshift measurement done with photometric redshifts and is consistent with the others. Uh, and of course, the error bars will continue to shrink, especially in the future. The, uh, the, the, the data will go deeper and the photometric redshift errors will be improved. Okay, now I can also look at these um, supernova fields. So these are fields which are uh, observed repeatedly in a cadence which optimizes the measurement of the light curve of supernovae. And using uh, selecting the supernovae type A, we can um, get a Hubble diagram, which is a redshift versus distance uh, diagram. And here, uh, using the first three years of the supernovae uh, data in DS, of the, of the supernovae field data in DS, uh, the team could obtain 207 type 1A supernovae, which are shown here in red at relatively high redshift. And for, to that, they combined it with some um, external data set, which has 122 low redshift supernovae, and together used it to uh, do a cosmological analysis. And they could derive constraints on omega lambda, omega matter, combined with various other probes, in particular CMB. And for example, if we focus on the omega matter W plane, like I showed before, so uh, you can see that this is the supernova constraints, and this is a CMB. If we combine them together, we get contours here, which again are consistent with W equal minus one, which is the uh, value which corresponds to cosmological constant. So to conclude, where do we stand? What well, this is ongoing. Still a lot of analysis is happening. There's already been a lot, uh, very important results and, and strong constraints on the cosmological model, both lambda CDM and extensions. Um, the uh, Y1 analysis is mostly done. As I said, the, the, soon there'll be a, a few more results coming from clusters. Of course, there'll be more analysis as well um, happening. But we're now all also very busy analyzing the third year uh, data release, which are not released yet, but the third year data. Um, the observations are complete. In fact, we completed uh, completely the observation about two weeks ago or so. Uh, and the, uh, the, the processing of this final data set is, is ongoing. If you're interested, uh, please stay tuned. We should have resolved this year and in the, in the coming years as well. You can find uh, information here on this web page and also the uh, Y1 data is, and a lot of the data products are now public and are available here on this link. Thank you very much. Yeah, questions, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Could you go back to your slide where you were showing uh, Des kids and Planck for SA at Omega M? Uh, this one, this one. This one. So in the right panel, why have the Planck contours changed? The right Compared panel, to the why left? have the Planck contour changed? That is a good I would imagine question. Planck should just be from the, from the chains that they supply. Yeah, I'm not sure, actually. 
Ah, the neutrino mass has been freed here or not here, or vice versa. Okay. Yeah. One needs to be quite careful uh, with, with that. Uh, thank you for clarifying. One has to be quite careful with the assumptions about neutrinos, even though. Uh, as was said from the talk before, they haven't been uh, detected. However, the assumption about the central value, if they're fixed or whether they're free, does make a difference. In fact, some of the some of the tension and systematics, some of the tension between different data sets can be traced back to to this actually. So some some collaborations were making different assumptions on the neutrino mass. Some of them were fixing it to a non-zero value. Some of them were fixing it to a zero value. Uh some of this is a follow-on to what you're just discussing. Um, I'm struck by inclusion of the correlated errors it has uh, changed the kids' results in particular. Um, how do we know that the errors are in fact w well encapsulated just by a covariance matrix and not by something that has uh, more non-Gaussian tails, especially for a complex system like yep. this? No, very good. So what is just to be clear, what has changed here is the tree, it's the part of the covariance matrix which was related to the shot noise, to the shape noise, and, and the interplay between the shape noise and the, the survey boundaries, which are more um, uh, severe in the case of kids, which is cut into smaller regions. And these are very subtle effects. Um, I think, well, some of it is being checked by uh, analytical, so there's analytical um, a calculation of this covariance matrix in HALO models or extensions. There's, of course, um, analysis done with the uh, numerical simulations and forward modeling and so on. Uh, but the fact that it moves like this is, is indeed, you know, at this level, everything matters, including this. That's the conclusion. Yep. Uh, also, I guess along the same lines, so, so in year one, you have 1,500 square degrees, so I guess it's like one third of the final data, mm -hmm. so I guess by the end of DS, you expect, I don't know, maybe a 50%? Uh, yeah, so there'll be 5,000 square right? degrees. Uh, let me show you that. So this is the, the Y1, which is 50, well, the weak lensing analysis only use 1,500 square degrees, actually we have a bit more in, in the Y1. Right. Eventually we'll have 5,000 square degrees. But in addition, we don't have the full depth in Y1. So it'll be deeper and larger. Right. So and, make... and it's not only this, sorry, if I can add, it's not only the depth, it's the fact that we have a large number of our exposures um, in each point, which give us even more control on systematics. Okay. So, so my question is that I would roughly guess that your improvement would be a factor of two, or mm -hmm. something like that at most. So I was wondering whether that improvement would be able to say something conclusive about the tension with Planck, or whether we will need to wait some, for something else. I haven't looked at the forecast, but I think, uh, first of all, we are, well, the, first of all, we're all, I think, I would argue, maybe the CMB people would disagree, we're all kind of systematics limited, so whether we get the factor of two, we'll see. Uh, a factor of two will, will, will help, right? I mean, I think if we look at these contours, if we could shrink, shrink these contours, by a factor of two, I think that could be quite decisive. Whether we'll achieve the factor of two with the yes, we have to see. Yeah. I mean, if you shrink this by a factor of two, you get something like this. If the tension remains, then... Yeah, 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 maybe. Yeah, I don't know, I, we should, yeah. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.